chapter 6, and we're going to be beginning with verse 41 and continuing through 59. John 6, 41 through 59. At this, the Jews began to grumble about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets. They will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. I tell you the truth. He who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real flesh, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me, and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. Let us pray. God, there is a lot of material here, and we're not going to even get a good glimpse of it. But what we do get, make a reach deep, change us, draw us closer into you, and let us abide there. From now on to all eternity. Amen. Throughout this spring and summer, at various times I've been I've been talking about some of the hard sayings of Jesus. For example, just last week we talked about how Jesus told the rich young man that that it's going to be very difficult for him to get into heaven because he did not want to give up his earthly treasures. It would be easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. That was hard enough because if the rich who have everything eligible to them can't get into heaven, how can the ordinary man? We discussed that. But this morning comes a hard saying which is even more difficult for the people to accept. Not only for us, but even for them. Because up until the saying that we reached this morning, the crowds were gathering around him. Left and right. Numbers were being drawn. Just the day before, he had a large crowd he was teaching. And we know the estimated numbers because it's called the feeding of the 5,000. Not the 4,962. Or the 38. No, the 5,000. But we are told that was 5,000 men, and then there were women and children. So it could easily be 20,000, if not more. And then, by the end of this chapter, John, people start walking away. A dramatic event happens. And this is just not because of something that Jesus did, but something he said. Well, he just fed those 5,000. So what happened in this period? 
Well, he fed the 5,000 people who were clamoring for more, but he decided to leave in the middle of the night. He sent the disciples ahead across the lake. They couldn't get that far. He decided to join them by walking across the water. Hey, don't we always do that? I do in January, maybe, but I think very carefully. Um, but Jesus joins them. The disciples are in awe. Who can do this? And they reach the other side of the lake. And there, the crowds who have, he had just left, realize he's gone, circle that lake, catch up with him, give us more bread. Why? Because in their teachings, and in the Old Testament itself, it says that Moses through the power of God, gave them bread in the wilderness. And it was expected that the Messiah would give them bread from heaven as well. Daily, for all eternity, that they would never die. And hearing this, Jesus denies their claim to make him king, but he wants to make this a teachable moment. He goes, you want bread? Let me tell you about bread. You know that bread from heaven, from God, that Moses brought? Yes, your ancestors did. And that's a wonderful thing. But where are those ancestors today? They're in the grave. Yes, they are in the grave. You want me to provide more bread? Well, I fed you yesterday. Isn't that enough? No, you want more. Rightly so, because what I have to provide for you is a bread that will make you live forever. Not like the manna that Moses brought, but the bread of life. And he's setting himself up as the giver of that bread. The people are ready to it. They're following the example of what we see in John 4. The Samaritan woman at the well. When she told Jesus, Oh, you have this living water? Well, give me this water so that I don't have to come to this well again. The people are now hearing from Jesus that he has this eternal life bread. Give us this bread that we might partake. Jesus got them right where he wants them. They bit the worm and they're hooked. But they ain't caught. <clears throat> about to deliver the next punch. You must eat of my flesh, which is the bread of life. Drink of my blood. We are privileged because we have all of John and Matthew, Mark, and Luke to fully understand what Jesus was saying. The Jews who were following Jesus, yes, they had Jesus in their midst, but they didn't have the full story. All they heard was, eat my flesh and drink my blood. We even find that offensive, for the Jews even more so. Because they weren't even allowed by Levitical law to eat any meat which still had blood in it. Then to think of human meat and human blood was just too vile to think of. And at that, they began saying, what Jesus is teaching is just too offensive, too hard to understand. One translation, I think it was the New English Bible, if I can picks up on this. In John 6.60, the New English Bible expresses some of the angst of the audience. In this translation, the crowd's response is written as, there's, this is more than we can stomach. Why listen to such talk?
Here's a man who you've been thinking is a great teacher, a great healer, and is now proposing seemingly cannibalistic ideas. How would you react? Now, if you do not read the full gospel account, you'd be much like those Jews, offended by Jesus. Matter of fact, we know later in church history that that was what the view by the Romans of the church. Because we heard, they heard that the church gathered together on a regular basis and ate his body and drank his blood. We were cannibals! But that was the perception. But it was, thankfully, it was the love of God which won people over. To see that we are not cannibals. We might be carnivores, but we're not cannibals. <laughs> and yes, we accept vegetarians and vegans as well. But God laid us here. But what does it mean? What does this eating of the flesh and drinking of the blood mean? It means definitely not in the literal effect. Because otherwise we are offended. We find it vile, disgusting, and going against every other doctrine that the Bible teaches. But if we look at what all the other parts of the Bible says, we get a better understanding. It's about our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It all comes to the point of how we are accepting Him. A lot of people accept Jesus on a mental ascent. Yes, I love His teachings, I've read Him, He is a great teacher, and I will do as He says. They may not accept Him as a Savior, but they see Him as a teacher, a moral teacher. My grandparents were that way. They tried to live a good life. But they never really, until the last few days of their life, accepted Christ. I praise the Lord that He was able to reach them. And they lived a good life, or a good example of how to live a good life. But it was an empty life. Then we have those who could go more than a sense and see Jesus as the salvation of their souls. Redeeming them from sin, and they are born anew. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> but that's still not the blood and the flesh. Because this is about two different things. First, what is eating and drinking? What do we do when we do actually eat food? We take it in. And while it may go to the stomach first, it's broken down. And through the power of the pumping heart, pumps those blood and those nutrients into the blood throughout the whole body. The heart is the muscle which is moving everything. Making sure it affects every single when we accept Jesus into our heart, we need to make sure it gets beyond the heart. Pumping through every course of us, our actions, our deeds, our thinking, our feelings. So we need to come saying, make this heart right. Yes, you bought me and saved me, but how do I make you more a part of my life? How do I internalize you? By allowing, like he tells us in John 10, abide in me. And as we abide in him, he abides in us. He will come into our hearts and make it new and fresh. If, it, if we don't allow him to do that, it still remains Vile, corrupt, 
wicked. Because he does tell us in various occasions in the Gospels that what comes out of one's heart defiles a man. So if we don't allow Jesus to cleanse our heart, we will remain in our wickedness and our sinful ways. We may be saved, but we are not changed. We need to be changed. And that is only done by Christ and allowing him to come in. And once we know in another scripture where he says, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be. Also, if your heart is on Jesus, you're thinking those heavenly things which Paul tells us to think about. We are just becoming more and more like the child he wants us to be, to be transformed in every essential way. But we have to allow him in. Now, does that mean communion changes us. That every time I take of that wafer and drink of that juice, I feel Jesus in me. Yes and no. Not in the sense that that wafer or that cup have any significance beyond that they are simple. A reminder, as we talked with the kids this morning, who Jesus is, what he has done. And so that brings those memories in, and which affects our mind, but also those objects brings back feelings, the heart, revitalizes us. Jesus, you died for me. You went willingly. You were arrested falsely. You were beaten, scourged, spit upon, made naked, nailed to a tree, hung out in public display, mocked, ridiculed, and died for me. If that doesn't evoke some sort of emotional response, I don't know what will. But from that, we draw, realizing where we are, and that what price he paid so that we could be redeemed and want to follow him more, worship him more, praise his name more. We can't just leave him at salvation and then try to live a good life for ourselves. We need to seek Christ out all the time. Make him be that transformative power. Some have looked at this passage in John and said, well, this is John's account of the Last Supper because Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell of the upper room experience. John does not. So they say this is his little segue to that idea. But he does it in thought versus action. To give maybe the scenario for why we do communion. To make Jesus alive within us. To change us. <clears throat> but many times when people hear this, they may not realize it, but instead of consuming Jesus, they're treating him more like bubblegum popping him in their presence, join the flavor, but when they're done with him, out he goes. But Jesus said, eat my flesh. That means his whole being. Drink his blood, his life-giving force. Make him his whole complete him, not what you want him to be, but who he is, a part of you. And then listen. Be changed. Communion is simply that. A reminder of all what we were just talking about. There are many reasons why we do have communion. To remind us ourselves that we are what Christ has done. To see how we are all united now as one family by the love of Christ. But it has so many nuances. 
but I like this also one which John gives. To remind us that it doesn't stop at salvation. That we need to keep pushing forward, saying each and every day, Lord, I've wronged you. I'm going to start with a few, but you know the rest. Because there's probably some I've missed. Please forgive me. Help me start a new. Draw me into you. Help me consume you by reading your word, talking to you daily. And not just talking at you, but talking to you and with you. And being changed. Because when you consume food, that food becomes a part of you. When you consume Jesus, and truly consume Jesus, he becomes part of you. The you who he truly wants you to be. Be who Jesus wants you to be. Be who Jesus wants you to be. By daily eating your master's flesh and drinking his blood. Let's pray. Lord, this is a very brief message on this heavy topic, and I know there will be a lot of questions. But sometimes, dear Lord, short and simple is the best, because that's how you express things. Short and simple parables, short and simple sayings, but still came out across with the same meaning. Follow me. Be with me. Abide with me. Dear Lord, help us to do that this very morning. And then, as we leave here, help us to abide in you. As we go tomorrow morning, help us to abide in you. Tuesday, abide. Wednesday, abide. Every day, abiding from now through eternity. Let your flesh and blood become one with us. As we get ready to have our invitation hymn.